to put on a free market. Or then finally, another thing we overlook with prizes is uh, Mises' great insight. Look at Mises, great economist. That's his uh, coat of arms there. And then the whole thing is sort of the symbol of the, the Mises Institute. You'll notice in the upper right part of the crest is the, the medical symbol. He came from a family of physicians. And then in the bottom left is the Bible open to the Ten Commandments. <clears throat> Mises seemed to be of the opinion that uh, uh, governments could stand to be reminded about the not stealing part, so that, that's staring at the face there. But Ludwig von Mises wrote an important article in 1920 called Economic Calculation of the Socialist Commonwealth. And he identified problem with socialism that had not been considered before. Like everybody had considered certain problems with socialism. Like, you know, if everybody's equal and all that, nobody's going to want to do the undesirable work. Like you ever seen that show Dirty Jobs? People earn a premium doing those dirty jobs because nobody else would want to do them. But if everybody's equal, who's going to do the dirty jobs? Like, okay, people already sort of do that. But Mises raised a whole different objection. It involves a price system. He says, let's suppose we have an economy in which there are no prices at all for the, what we call the factors of production. Factors of production would be the things that businesses use in order to produce them. So uh, machinery, uh, you know, capital equipment, land, Anything like this, raw materials, all the ingredients and machinery that goes into producing the stuff that you and I use, these are all factors of production. Suppose they had no prices. So there is no price of steel, there is no price for lumber, there's no price for rubber, no price for wood. There are no prices. You have to operate as a businessman in a world without prices for the factors that you have to buy to produce goods. Let's imagine you lived in that kind of society. Well, there are probably trillions of different combinations of ways that the whole society could combine all the materials at our disposal. We could have four units of wood, and three units of rubber, and five units of something else for this particular production process, and we could locate the plant on this plot of land, or we could do this production process with this much, and we could locate it over here. We could There's so many different ways we could combine these things to produce goods. But obviously, there's only one way that's optimal from the point of view of I mean, let's say, because there are no prices, I start building pickup trucks out of platinum. Well, this is probably not the most urgent use for platinum. There are other perfectly serviceable metals that would serve for a pickup truck other than platinum. This would be a completely ludicrous thing for me to do, but with no prices to tell me this particular thing is scarce, or this particular thing is in high demand, so unless you really, really need it, you should use something else. What's to stop me from using it? And so the problem is, we could wind up with an economy in which we are doing ludicrously and destructively uneconomic things. I mean, like, let's, let's make it let's suppose we've got two possibilities. I, I, I've got a production process, and I could either use four units of wood and three units of rubber to produce this good, or I could just as easily produce just the same kind of wood. I could use four units of rubber and three units of wood. How do I know if there's no price? How do I know which one is less wasteful to society? How do I know this? Maybe there's some other line of production that needs the, the wood more urgently than I do, so maybe I should be doing the three units of wood, four units of rubber combination. But if there's no price system, there's no way for someone to bid prices up and bid that resource away from me, how do we ever reach this? How do I know whether I should use more wood or more rubber? Wood and rubber are incommensurable. How can I say which is worth what? But if we have prices, if wood is $5 and rubber is $4, well then I can compare them because I can express them in terms of a single unit, namely dollars. And so then, if there are prices for all these things, wood and steel and rubber and all that, then entrepreneurs can use the price system to determine what combination of all these myriad goods and all these different ways they can be put together best serves the consumers, in which there is the least waste, in which I'm not using urgently needed goods in one line of production that are really more urgently needed over there, Price system sorts it out so that the most urgent wants of the consumers are satisfied first. They can calculate profit and loss simply by, by taking, here's the dollars I spent on the factors of production, here's the dollars I earn from the sales revenues, and then I subtract one from the other and I decide did I make a profit or did I make a loss. And if I make a profit, that means I'm putting resources to uses that society wants me to put them to. If I'm making losses, then society is saying those resources shouldn't have been used in some other way. And so this occurs every single day thanks to the fact that we have a free price system that exists in the factors of production. That we can figure out what's the best combination of these resources through trial and error and through calculating profit and loss. 
But under socialism, strict socialism, which socialism being defined as a system in which the factors of production are all monopolistically owned by the government, socialism can't calculate profit and loss because it has no prices for wood or lumber or, any, or uh, steel or any of those things. It has no prices because there's no buying and selling going on. If the government owns all the wood and owns all the rubber and owns all the physical plant and owns all the machinery, these things are never bought and sold. They already own everything. There's no need to buy or sell anything. They own it all. The government owns them. So it never gives rise to prices to assign to these goods. So the Socialist Planning Board, when it says, okay, here are the things we need to produce and here's the combination of inputs we're going to use to produce them, is groping in the dark. It has no way of knowing if it's combining resources in a way that's sensible or in a way that is completely destructive of economic value. You can't calculate profit and loss because there is no number, no, no, no number, no cardinal number that it can attach to the factors of production. And so Mises says, so therefore socialism can't calculate. It's impossible. You would, it, we would return to barbarism instantly if we adopted a system like this in which a planning board gropes in the dark to figure out how to deploy the resources of society. And that's why most systems, in fact, I would say all systems, other than a very, very brief case under the Soviet Union, have not really been truly socialist systems. They wouldn't dare try it. And they know it. They wouldn't dare try it. They wouldn't dare try operating without a price system. Because, in fact, what they wound up doing was cheating by looking at world prices, which is what are the greedy capitalists charging for steel, and then they would use that. They have to use something in order to make some kind of a groping attempt at rationality. Or some of these socialist economies, it turns out, were not fully socialist. They were just really, really, really interventions. But they allowed enough private property so as to generate prices and the factors. So Mises identified that the heart of the system, the Marxian version of socialism, it would, it would result in a return to barbarism. This is not a step forward. It's a step backwards. And so you think, so the, the free market just does this every day. Calculation, because of free prices, allows us to make these decisions so that we are engaging in the least waste possible. All right, well, that's all, you know, sort of technical stuff. What about something that's sort of easier for, I think, the average person to get? The fact that we have seen the greatest conquest of poverty ever in the history of mankind, in the age in which we have seen the greatest movements toward uh, the liberation of markets. Now, it's true that we have not seen as much movement in that direction as would be uh, desirable. But nevertheless, that has been the trend. E even, even in the Scandinavian welfare states that are so often cited, we've seen movements in this direction. So, for example, in 1820, some 85% of the world's population lived in what economists call absolute poverty. Now, by 1950, that figure had fallen to 50%, and by 19, uh, early 1980s, it was down to one-third. Absolute poverty in the developing countries fell from 40 to 21 percent, and thus the global rate from one third down to 18 percent between 1981 and 2001. Now, this has never happened in any two decade period ever in the history of the world. That we've seen uh, not only the percentage of people in poverty, but also the, the absolute number of people in poverty fall. This has never happened before. We've seen more progress against poverty in the last 50 years than in the previous 500. In 1960, the life expectancy of the poorer countries was only 60% of that of the richer countries. It's now 80%. Caloric intake in the third world has grown by one-third since the 1960s. In late 19th century England, rich and poor were separated by 17 years in life expectancy. That's now two years. They were once separated by five inches in height between rich and poor, and that's now less than one inch. Kind of interesting, oddball statistic. Uh, in, in the U.S., we've seen a poverty rate uh, falling from, I mean, again, by today's standards, uh, if you look in the early 20th century, everybody would be considered poor. I mean, literally 95% of the population was considered, by 2010 standards, was considered to be poor. But by the end of the 20th century, that was down to 12 to 14 percent, and, and, and more or less, more or less holding, holding uh, steady. It had been continuing to fall, by the way, um, from 1950 to 1968 by about a percentage point per year, before there really were uh, 
was much in the way of anti-poverty programs, but about 1% point per year we saw it fall. Then by 1968, which is when the real funding for the war on poverty programs got started, that's when it starts to stagnate. And so by 19, mid-1990s, poverty rate is still roughly the same as it was at the beginning of the war on poverty, and yet by the mid-1990s, uh, about four times as much money was being spent on it per capita as it had been spent in the past. So the market has this extraordinary way of dealing with poverty in ways that we've just never seen through any, any coercive means. The bottom quintile, so that is the bottom 20% of the population, saw its real incomes over the course of the 20th century increase by 1900%. The rich did not see that much of an increase in their incomes. I mean, the, rich, you know, the rich already had some reasonable forms of transportation, and flush toilets and whatever. So okay, now they've got three toilets or 10 toilets, but that's not as big of a difference as going from an outhouse to a toilet. That's, that's the important thing, that that's what most people endure. And it's true that, you know, for the, in 1940, a lot of people, a lot of rich people had cars, a lot of poor people didn't. Um, but the key thing is that by later in the century, the rich people still have cars. They have fancier cars. They have cars with GPSs built in. But there's a big difference between getting from one place to another, uh, walking around in your shoes, and driving around in a beat-up Chevy. That's a much bigger difference between a nice car and a super nice car. So it's actually the bottom uh, groupings in society, in terms of economic, in terms of income, that have seen the greatest advances. And then, so, uh, so on and on, of course, now we are all, all of us, rich or poor, are able to have recourse to and, and, and acquire goods that people just couldn't possibly have imagined. I mean, things that the Habsburgs didn't even have on the eve of World War I are things that, that people now come and take for granted. Now, but maybe, though, maybe this is all just a coincidence. Maybe people just got rich, um, because of some other factors, and it has nothing to do with the fact that the market system has been has been spread. So I want to introduce a thought experiment here to suggest that no, these things are indeed correlated. And the thought experiment is this: Let's imagine we have an economy in which there's no machinery at all, like all the machinery is sucked away by an alien force, and so we're left with just our bare hands, and we've got no communication devices, and we've got no transportation other than animal power transportation, let's say. So we're, we're reverting to the most primitive economy imaginable. Let's suppose that happens over now. We all immediately see that we would produce far, far less than we were producing before when we had modern assembly line methods and machines that made our economy physically productive. We would all see that working with our bare hands, we produce a tiny pittance of what we've become accustomed to. So therefore, per capita, for each person in the society, every one of us is going to have to learn to make do with a whole lot less not simply in terms of the quantity of goods we're going to have to learn to live with, but also entire classes of goods will be entirely unavailable. I mean, try, try making a plasma TV with your bare hands from scratch. Okay, it's impossible. You do it. Try building a Chevy with your bare hands from scratch. cannot be done. So what, what would we do? How would we want to get that economy out of its poverty? Would we want to look for all the rich people in that society and try to redistribute their extra money? Well, in that type of society, how much extra money could they have? How much extra resources could possibly be produced in such a primitive economy? So, as one of my friends puts it, I mean, let's suppose in a society like that that one out of a thousand people is a rich capitalist and he eats twice as much food and has, you know, let's say 20 times as much furniture as a poor person. All right, so what if we then divide his excess food consumption, excess furniture uh, consumption? By 999, we distribute that across the population. Anyone even going to notice the difference? Oh, wow, I now have an extra 150th of a table leg that I didn't have before. Of course, we wouldn't even notice the difference. So what is the real way to get this economy out of that situation? And this is a situation, by the way, they're not in because wicked exploiters are refusing to pay high wages. That the economy can't produce enough stuff. It doesn't matter how many physical dollars you have. If you go to the store, there's nothing on the shelf. It doesn't matter. So... What's the solution? The solution is, get the machines back somehow. I mean, let's assume the Martians, that's a, the alien force is just gone. We, gotta just, we have to save our money, and then that savings will then be invested in the machinery that's necessary to make the production process more physically productive, to make the goods of the society more abundant, and therefore the greater abundance we can produce with, if we have a steam shovel rather than a regular shovel, or a typewriter instead of using the labor of scribes, or a forklift instead of our bare hands. We can do so much more work 
we can produce so many more goods at lower cost, and that lower cost gets passed on to consumers uh, because of competition. And so the result is that our incomes can purchase us more and more goods over time because they're becoming more abundant, and competition among suppliers brings their prices down. Now, parenthetically, in our economy, of course, we haven't noticed for a century, we haven't seen prices come down because they're always increasing the money supply. So this, this process is masked. But we do see it in the 19th century, and we see it today in electronics and computers. Prices consistently come down in those areas over time. We just have come to expect it. And so this is how our living standards increase, is that there is this investment in capital equipment that makes the production process more physically productive, goods more abundant, their prices lower in terms of how many minutes we have to work in order to earn the money to buy them, and then our living standards are improved. I mean, think of how many minutes you would have had to work to earn the money necessary to buy what is today a cell phone in 1970. Imagine what would have been necessary, all the sacrifices that would have been necessary in that society to bring about that technology. It would have been absolutely prohibitive. All the things we would have had to sacrifice in order to apply the resources to cell phone production would have been just completely off the charts. But yet we take this entirely for granted, like this is just automatic, like the institutional forms don't matter, these things just, just occur. So in other words, this is an area in which if we don't understand how this works, then we can shoot ourselves in the foot very easily. And one way to shoot ourselves in the foot, of course, would be to tax this process. Would be to tax people who are engaged in this very process of taking profits and then investing them in capital equipment so as to make possible the rise in our living standards, a rise that occurs not because we steal from one group and give to another, that there's no overall rise, but a spontaneous, voluntary process. That is interrupted every time we tax or, or sledgehammer or whatever people who are engaged in it. And yet we're all taught from, from birth that that's what we need to do. These, these blood suckers need to be bashed and taxed and looted and expropriated. But you understand that, that doing that is just shooting ourselves a foot. I mean, we, don't, we shouldn't want to do that. This is an area in which we all have the same interests in society. Everybody should want this process to continue unhampered, but yet nobody realizes that, unfortunately, and so we, we, we continue to hurt ourselves. All right, so there's, there's my, little, my little shtick about the virtues of the market. All right, but now what about this? You know, we did just see this rap video after all, and you know, how can you not say something about that? So I'm going to. I'm going to say a little something about the freaking business cycle, because people are very interested in this right now, because we're, we're, sort, of endur we're sort of enduring the bust tail of a business cycle. And this is an area in which, man, do we need education. And you think, well, you know, no economics, not interesting, but as I say, more and more people are getting interested in it, the more they give it a chance, the more they read the, the Austrian school of economics. But also, you know, when when you get when your portfolio gets wiped out, when you really take a beating, suddenly people get interested. And they because they wonder why what in the world just happened? And you know, as, as my friend Lou Rockwell puts it, you know, people are always saying that. This or that aspect of economics or the Federal Reserve is just boring and not interesting. And Lou says, no, you know what? I think the fact that I'm getting ripped off is quite interesting. As a matter of fact, I don't find this boring at all. I'm very interested in this. So, all right, so the business cycle thing, we saw a little bit. Now, if you haven't ever read the positions of Keynes and Hayek, this might be a, a little difficult to follow, but you, you can't help coming to yourself, blame low interest rates. Like, yeah, that's right. Yeah, well, I don't know what that means, but it's catchy. <laughs> that's right. Because I mean, you're inclined to think, well, wait a minute, I like low interest rates. Like, who doesn't like low interest rates? But, of course, we, have, we like low everything. We don't like milk prices to be 10 cents a gallon. But if we made milk prices 10 cents a gallon, would that mean that all of us would be able to get 10 cent milk? It would mean that none of us would have any milk. Because no one's going to supply it at 10 cents, and everyone's going to demand. So it's not enough just to say, well, something's desirable. Therefore, we should force it into existence. I, I wish we lived in a comic book world like that, but we don't. We have to be mature adults about this. All right, so when we talk about a business cycle, all we mean is, how come the economy seems to just move in this up and down pattern? Like we're all doing great, and then we're all in the toilet, and then we're doing great, and on and on and on. And this has just happened so much that we're all inclined to think, well, it's just the way you know capitalism is. You've got to take the good with the bad. You know, I mean, it's it's good. It gives us a lot of you know a lot of bread, and peanut butter, and stuff. But it's bad, and then it just goes up and down. You know, you've got to take the good with the bad. But what Hayek is suggesting that that's not really the case. That actually, it seems like it's, a, it's an outside force, not within the market itself, that's causing this. 
Because if we look at the, the modern period where we start to see um, you know, what we would recognize as business cycle, it's also the same time that we see the modern banking system come into effect. Or perhaps there's some kind of connection between these two things. So what Hayek wants to know is, why is it that all of a sudden, entrepreneurs whom the market has selected for their ability at forecasting consumer demand, why are they all suddenly so bad at this? Why are they all suddenly, but not, obviously not literally all of them, but why are so many of them, the cluster, suddenly making errors? Why are there so many losses concentrated at one time? I mean, well, you can say, well, you know, people aren't buying as much stuff, but why didn't they anticipate that? That's their job, is to anticipate that. And so is to slough off uh, some of their uh, inputs and, and reduce their output and continue to be profitable. How come they didn't anticipate this? Well, why are they blindsided? It's, it's a good question. And, it, it, and this is what Hayek wins the Nobel Prize for. And I realize, you know, that Nobel Prizes are being given out like candy today. So you're, <laughs> you're inclined to think a Nobel Prize, you know, Schmobel Prize. But the significance of Hayek's prize, Hayek is one of these economists in this so-called Austrian school. Hayek wins the prize for telling the Nobel Committee the exact opposite of what it wants to hear. So that is significant. You know, when you say exactly what they want to hear, well, okay, you win the prize. But it's significant that Hayek wins it for that reason. Let me just say in parentheses, when I say Austrian school of economics, I've got to be very clear about this. Um, we're not, I, I, don't, I also don't mean this as a joke. I do want to clarify this. People are coming to this for the first time. We're not talking about anything having to do with Austria. If, if Austria were following Austrian economics, it would have higher living standards than it had. Or, or if it followed the implications of, the policy implications of Austrian economics, it would be doing even better than it is. But uh, the school, rather, is a school of thought. It's called the Austrian school because it's early... Theorists came from Austria. So Karl Menger, Eugen von Bomberg, uh, both of whom we have t-shirts uh, of, by the way, at the Mises Institute. <laughs> I have just a Bomberg one because my wife has imposed a t-shirt quota on me uh, when it comes to economist shirts. So uh, if, I, if I get a new one, I have to send another one to Goodwill. Just, I mean, to me, it's, I don't want to make light of people's situation, but it would be interesting to see some average guy who just needs a t-shirt walking around with one bobber, you know, on, not realize the significance of this, but maybe, maybe, you know, maybe he'll look him up and it'll be a revolution in his life, I don't know. Anyway, I think I should donate more shirts is what I'm thinking of as I stand here. But anyway, sorry, so the Austrian school, we identify it with, with people like uh, in the 20th century, with Hayek, with Ludwig von Mises, who really uh, pioneered the theory of the business cycle that Hayek then elaborated in the 1930s. Mises dies in 1973, Hayek wins the prize in 1974. He wins it for work he did in the 1930s, which is why some people wonder, well, wait a minute, wait a minute. Maybe it was that, because uh, I've heard Rothbard and a few other people say this, Mises was so uncompromising. You know, he, just, he just believed in the economics of freedom, and, and you know, he made value judgments in his own private writing, and, and he, he believed in the laissez-faire economy, and so he can't possibly give a prize to this Neanderthal, so, so Mises dies, and then they give it to Hayek for basically the same work. Uh, is one theory that maybe that they waited for because they couldn't possibly award it to, to Mises. I mean, it is a little odd that Hayek would win it for such old work, but it, it doesn't matter. That's an entirely separate theory we talk about over drinks later. We're, we're meeting at the Wild Boar, which I think is just coffee. So you might have to bring your own spiking agent to the to the event. But anyway, so how does Hayek get to account for this? Uh, well, this is called, the theory that he, he helps to develop is called the Austrian theory of the business cycle. And it basically involves a couple of, <coughs> excuse me, a couple of quick concepts that are not difficult to get. And then we can just understand this theory very quickly and then see why, understanding this, if we have this knowledge, it can help us to pursue policies that, again, won't, not only won't shoot us in the foot, but will guarantee that will, that will, that will lead to prosperity. In the future, lead to smooth, consistent economic growth instead of boom and bust. Basically, the two concepts we're going to introduce are number one, uh, the idea of structure of production. This is not complicated at all. It just means that consumer goods do not fall out of the sky. Uh, Twinkies do not fall out of the sky. Although I, I actually want to let's pretend I didn't give that example because I don't want to know why they make Twinkies. To be honest with you, I really, I really don't want to know. Like it's, it's just uh, all the chemical agents involved. I mean, there's nothing about the old things that mom used to bake for you in related to Twinkies, a whole different matter. So let's think about a bagel, because you can make a bagel innocently enough. The bagel does not just appear out of nowhere in the bagel shop. 
It begins ultimately with a farmer and his harvest. And so we refer to this, or let's say it's any old metal thing that I might have, you know, my pen, my watch, let's say. I mean, you know, you got a you got a mine, you know, you know, you gotta go into to the mines and all the rest of it, and, you know, raw material extraction. Those aspects of production are what we call higher order stages of production because they're so far away from an actual watch or a bagel. I mean, a farmer engaged in this harvest, you're not going to hang around saying, when's that bagel going to be ready? Because I mean, it has to go through various uh, processing and all that, and distribution and whatever else, and then finally it becomes a bagel. Uh, or, you know, the clothes you're wearing, it has to start off as cotton, and again, you have to engage in all kinds of processing of cotton, make it, get the seeds out of it, whatever. So the point is that the production process proceeds through a series of stages, from higher order to the lowest order, which would be the finished consumer good itself, the watch, the bagel, the hat, the toothbrush, whatever. So goods go through these stages, that's all. That's all. That's, that's the stage of production idea. I think that is a realistic way of understanding how, how uh, production works. Okay, secondly, is this idea. When interest rates are low, this is when businesses tend to be more likely to engage in long-term projects. Why is that? Because the longer term your project is, the more pain those interest payments are going to be in your neck. Uh, anybody with a 30-year mortgage understands this principle. The first month you make that payment, and then you get the second month's stub in the mail, and you get to see how much principal you paid last month, and how much interest. You say, what the heck? Are you ready to commit an atrocity? You can't believe how much interest you paid. Well, you know, when the loan is stretched out over 30 years, those interest payments are going to be really painful. Whereas if you had a mortgage for like, instead of 30 years, 30 days, you would hardly even notice the interest payments. So in other words, the longer term the thing is, the more the interest payments are going to weigh on you. So that is to say, if you have a long-term project, the interest rates suddenly become lower. Well, wait a minute, that's going to have a big effect on these long-term projects. So projects that might have seemed unprofitable in the past, if you can get, get it financed at a low interest rate, you might say, oh, wait a minute, maybe that will in fact turn out okay. Maybe I will pursue that. So that's what businesses do. And interest rates, how do they become low in the first place? They become low on a free market because the general public saves more. When we save more, the banks have more stuff to lend. They have more money to lend. And so to put it very crudely, the price of borrowing goes down. The banks are just lousy with money. They, just, they want to just throw it out the window to potential borrowers. They're just dying to get rid of it. They'll offer lower interest rates. They've got more of it, just supply and demand. So that's it. Those are the those basic concepts. Once we got that, now we just go through two scenarios. A healthy scenario and a sick scenario. The healthy scenario is this. All right, the general public saves. Interest rates are lower. Longer term projects are engaged in. You know, uh, more research and development, whatever, all these things. More mining capacity, uh, buying you know, more capital, whatever. whatever. All these higher order stages are expanded. Disproportionately. Those are disproportionately stimulated. Okay, so this is great for two reasons. Number one, because we see how beautifully coordinated it is in, in these two ways. Uh, the first is that if, if you and I save more, that is basically a way in which we are implicitly saying, I am not going to blow every cent in my paycheck this moment. I'm going to save some of it. I'm going to defer some of my purchases for the future. I'm not going to blow all my money now. I'm going to purchase some, some things in the future. Well, that's great, because what are businesses engaged in now, disproportionately? Long-term production for the future. All right, so I'm saving for the future, and they're going to have something for me to spend it on in the future. But secondly, think of this. If, if you and I save more, we're not buying as many hats or watches or eyeglasses or whatever, then those industries are going to start to shrink a little bit. I mean, if they don't have to produce as many things, well, then they may try. Uh, raw materials, trucking, whatever, for use at the higher order stages. So that this makes possible the physical wherewithal 
to see all these new production, production projects through to completion. So we've got a contraction down here that makes possible the expansion of you. Again, this is all being coordinated through interest rates that are allowed to be free and fluctuate and tell entrepreneurs the truth. But now let's, let's imagine the sick scenario. And in the sick scenario, there is a sinister institution that interferes with interest rates. And I don't want to name specifically right now, I don't want to prejudice you against it. So <clears throat> let's just say, you know, what, whatever, there's just some old institution. And in this case, it just decides, well, we just want interest rates lower. Let's just force them down, right? We're sick of being high. Let's force them down. That'd be super. There'd be more borrowing, which would be more jobs. Great. Great. Okay, here's the problem. Here's why this is not great. Okay, as in the first scenario, as in the healthy scenario, we have businesses say, oh, my goodness, lower interest rates, super. Now's the time for, you know, the longer term projects seem more profitable. Off to the races. But here's the difference. In this case, consumers are not, the interest rates aren't lower because we're saving more. We're not saving more in this case. They're low because some guy wanted them to be lower. It's not because we're saving. We're not saving. In fact, we might even be consuming more than before. So in this case, we're not deferring our purchases for Sure, we want more of existing goods right now, but businesses are engaged in long-term product development for the future. There's a mismatch here. They're not doing what consumers really want. They've been misled. But secondly, if consumer goods industries are not contracting, they're not releasing resources to make possible the completion of all these new projects. That's what the video means when it says that you know, we, we get started, we, we start grabbing for resources, we realize there aren't enough. That the economy has become too ambitious because of these artificially low rates. It's trying to do more of this and more of this. Well, where's this going to come from? Mars? Where do the resources come from? We don't, nobody has to stop consuming for us to engage in this long-term production. How is that possible? How can that be? We have to make sacrifices. It's precisely our saving that makes possible the higher order of expansion. But we're not saving. We're spending. And they're spending. And so instead of resources smoothly and spontaneously moving from this stage to this stage, we have a tug of war going on between the higher and lower order stages over this fixed amount of resources. And that bids their prices up. As, as the, the lower order stages say, no, 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 we need the workers. And the higher order say, no, no, we need it. No, we need the trucks. No, you need the trucks. And we need them. No, we need them. And that makes their price get higher and higher as they compete with them. And so these projects are going to become obvious. They're not so profitable after all. The costs are prohibitive. And we wind up with a bust. Now, basically, the, the, uh, this can be summed up in Mises' beautiful metaphor from his book, Human Action. And that metaphor is, imagine, he says, if you have trouble understanding this business cycle theory, imagine an economy with one guy doing one thing. And I can convey the business cycle theory to you that one. Imagine we have one master builder building a house that requires 20% more bricks to complete than he has. And now remember, this is the whole economy. It's this guy and his bricks. By definition, there are no other bricks. So as he's building, of course, he's building an unbuildable house. This is an unsustainable path. He's become overambitious. He doesn't know it yet. But the sooner he finds out, the better. Because then he won't waste his time working on something that can never be finished. It's better for him to discover it sooner rather than later. If he discovers it at the very end, then he's going to demolish the whole freaking house. That's not good for him. So that, in effect, is what's happening to the economy. Is that it, like the master builder, he is trying to do an incompatible mix of things. It, it, it can't finish. It doesn't have the resources to do all the things it's been misled into doing. So let's say, though, <clears throat> let's say we feel bad, this is my own personal contribution to Austrian business cycle theory, let's say that we feel sorry for the master builder, I mean, here he is building this house, he's never going to be able to finish it. What if we, feeling bad for him, we just got him drunk so that he wouldn't notice the dwindling supply of bricks? He'd just keep whistling while he's working, it would be great, okay? All right, so he's doing that. Are we actually helping this guy? Is that helping? I mean, I mean, look, we're putting him to work, right? He's got a job. Isn't that all we care about is jobs? Well, okay, yeah, he's got a job destroying wealth. That's his job. Destroying wealth, taking these bricks and, and assembling them into a configuration that can't be finished and will have to be demolished. Is that good? Is that helping society? Are we glad that he's employed in this? Obviously, we've just made it worse because when the discovery inevitably comes and he can't do this, it's all the worse for him. And so that's why this is exactly analogous to when we have the bust in a boom bust cycle in our economy and we then get the suggestion. Well, we need lower interest rates. Even lower, that'll solve the problem. Well, that's like saying, what we need to do for the master builder is liquor him up, and then he won't notice. This just intensifies the problem. It makes us continue on the unsustainable path instead of realizing we've made a mistake. And this is the answer to Hayek's question. 
Why are businesses being misled? Why are they all making losses at the same time? Because the structure of interest rates, which is essential to entrepreneurial activity, has all been falsified. They're all, been, they're all being given green lights when they should have been given red lights half the time. They're, they're being misled into doing things they shouldn't be doing. The economy can't sustain. So it's this precisely this intervention into the market that we're told is actually, no, 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 the free market causes this. No, no, this isn't the free market. It's intervention into it. And what the analogy of the master builder also discloses to us is that the recession, strictly speaking, as painful as it is, the recession is not strictly the problem. And again, that's what in, in the video. Uh, the Hayek character says that what we need to focus on is not the bust, which is what everybody focuses on now. Oh my gosh, this is a bust, what do we do? We have to focus our attention on the boom period, where we had all this artificial stuff, we had a lot of artificial wealth, we had the metaphorical equivalent of somebody building an unbuildable house. We have to go back and look there. That's where the seeds of the destruction were planted. That was the problem. The bust is the economy saying, wait a minute, this can't work. We have to redeploy resources in in lines of production where they truly belong. And we have been doing that. We've been putting them in the wrong lines of production. Now, Alan Greenspan was a uh, Federal Reserve, uh, I mean, it's the Federal Reserve System, by the way. There's your institution that I was disclosing, I was, I was uh, keeping from you. Uh, it's, it's Greenspan, who was referred to as, by the New York Times, as the infallible maestro of our financial system. And a good old creepy Pravda like New York Times, right? Saying that about it, because in 2001, you know, we're at the end of the dot-com bust, and Greenspan is tired of, of uh, being in, in recession, so we get a relatively mild recession. And in 2001, what does he do? He lowers interest rates 11 times. And then, sure enough, the economy, you know, seems to recover. People say, wow, this guy's fantastic. It's amazing. Just one guy, one former saxophone player, can take the entire economy. And just by fiddling with some figures and doing some things in the economy, the central planning board, he can, it's amazing what this guy can do. But what, what was he doing? Well, he was doing the functional equivalent of intoxicating the master builder. Because in fact, I mean, literally, look at what happened to housing. That was the first recession ever on record in which housing starts went up. So people drew the conclusion that, wow, gee, even in a recession, housing is robust. I guess I should just get five investment houses. I should... Housing prices never go down. All these myths that we were sold, we were sold because they seemed believable at the time. Because the Fed, instead of allowing the economy to restructure and interest rates to reflect reality and speculators to stop speculating because interest rates would be high and they'd say, oh, wait a minute, maybe I better invest in something else. No, interest rates were kept low. So again, instead of a red light, we got a green light. Hayek says the interest rate is supposed to be like a break. It's supposed to be like the brakes on our ambitions, so we don't get too ambitious. No, no, everybody was just full steam ahead. Keep on going. Keep on doing exactly the same thing, so that when the bus came, it was all the worse because all the more people are involved in the crazy housing market, so it's, the pain is all the more widespread. Now, now I want to say a little something about the Federal Reserve System, and I may go a little bit over my time. I hope you'll forgive me for this. I don't get to Colorado much. I've got to stuff all this information into this room quick, uh, while I'm standing here. But the Federal Reserve System is, uh, you know, which was created by Act of Congress in late 1913, goes into existence the following year. This is an institution that up until about two to three years ago, you hardly heard any, you certainly didn't hear a negative word about it. Maybe once in a while you hear it's not inflating, it's not creating enough money out of thin air. But other than that, there's almost no mention of it, certainly no politician talks about it. Uh, we are just not, well, we, we regular people, we weren't even entitled to an opinion about it. We peons even aren't even allowed to talk about how dare you say something about your wise overlords in charge of money and interest rates. They can centrally plan money and interest rates. I mean, and so on and on, right? I mean, and to this day, uh, the, the elites consider us unbelievably uppity for having the nerve to make demands of this institution or disclose information or to be critical of it. Who do we think we are? And then meanwhile, the gatekeepers of approved opinion, the 60 minutes of the world, have had, which has now had the Federal Reserve Chairman on twice. They have him on. They don't even understand the issues at stake, so they let him get away with all these whoppers. They throw him, so it's a softball interview. It's like uh, Katie Couric interviewing Hillary Clinton. Like the whole thing, softball questions the whole time. And that's what we get. Again, it's like problem, instead of actually sticking them with some really good questions. The beauty is, thanks to the internet, we can get around these gatekeepers. 
An average person can create a video called Bernanke was wrong, and tens of thousands of people watch it immediately. And it's a clip of Bernanke just saying one inane thing after another, that the opposite comes true, and no one calls him on it because he's, he's our wise overlord. But, but now, now it's different. Now the general public can make him an object of ridicule. His sacred personage can become an object of ridicule. This has never happened before. John Stewart, I mean, he's basically on the left, is making fun of this guy, saying, well, come on now, why do you just admit you're just a guy with a beard that you create money out of thin air? You know? You're not some wizard. It's just unbelievable. This, we have never seen anything like this before. This is a very liberating step forward. But up to now, again, we have shot ourselves in the foot because so many people have just taken for granted that what they're being told by the establishment is true. But what we've been told about the Fed is not true, and it has harmed us not to have the knowledge that we need about it. I mean, the New Republic magazine, which I wouldn't wish that on anyone, a subscription to the New Republic, but if you ever read the New Republic, you remember there was that, that uh, some of you might remember this from the late 80s, early 90s, that they had this journalist named Stephen Glass, and he used to bring the most fascinating stories. And, and other journalists would be envious of him, and other editors would say to their journalists, why did you break the story? It's unbelievable. Glass is breaking all the good stories. How, how did he break all these good stories? He made them up. <laughs> None of them were true. He invented them. And in the pre-internet age, it was much easier to get away with that, because you can't just Google some company name. So you can make up phony companies, phony people. And eventually he got caught, and actually made a, I, I highly recommend the movie they made, called Shattered Glass, very worth seeing. But I bring this up because one of the stories he made up was a story in which investors on Wall Street supposedly built a little shrine to Alan Greenspan with, with flowers and candles and his image. They would gather in front of it and meditate. <laughs> but what's odd about this is that nobody noticed that was a phony story. Nobody said, oh, wait a minute, who in his right mind? is going to do something like this. People thought at the time, well, that seems like something that somebody might do. Sure. <laughs> so it's wonderful to see somebody like this uh, brought back down to earth. All right, so what are we told all the time about the Fed? Well, you know, thank goodness you stupid rubes have the Fed, because without the Fed, you know, well, you'd have all these booms and busts. <clears throat> They're not making that argument quite as often today, but that is the usual thing. You know, like before the Fed, look at all the terrible things that happened before the Fed. All right. Because the economy before the Fed is extremely volatile, you know, I mean, it's a lot of production, a little production, it's all crazy all over the map, and the Fed has smoothed all this out, and all the rest of it. All right, but you know what's fantastic is that in recent years, mainstream economists, even Christina Romer, who was a top economist for Obama, believe it or not, has actually done some useful work going back and looking at the old figures from the pre-Fed years to see how accurate they are. And it turns out that, as my friend um, uh, George Selgin puts it, they're about as accurate, these old figures from the 19th century, to measure how stable the economy was. You would get better results from looking at cheap entrepreneurs than you would looking at these figures. And, and for reasons that if in the question period you want more detail on that, I can give it to you. But the point is that, well, not about sheep, I don't know anything about that. But the point is that actually when you reconstitute these figures, uh, these figures were actually making it look like uh, the pre-Fed years were much more volatile than they were, and the post-Fed years were much less volatile than they were. When you correct for that, you actually find that a lot of this drops out. So, for example, uh, it exaggerates both the number and the duration of economic downturns that we had before the Fed. Um, uh, re recessions were not more frequent in the pre-Fed than the post-Fed period. Now, Selgin, a professor at the University of Georgia, has said, all right, you know what, I'm going to be real sportive. When I measure the performance of the Fed, I am not even going to include the Great Depression, even though it occurred under the Fed's watch. Because we all know the Great Depression was just practice. So we won't even count that. We'll be real sports about it. But even if we get rid of that, okay, we get rid of the Great Depression, we do find economic down, uh, contractions are somewhat more frequent in the period before the Fed uh, than after. But they were also almost three months shorter on average and no more severe. Recoveries were faster in the pre-Fed period. Uh, and if we extend the pre-Fed period, not to just the period that, uh, from like the 1870s, where Romer was looking, but if we look at uh, Joseph Davis and other economists, look from the 1790s to 1950, he finds no appreciable difference at all between the length and duration of recessions uh, in the pre-Fed and, and the uh, 
the post-Fed period. But maybe it has given the economy more stability. The economy's been more stable. It's wildly fluctuating before the Fed announced <clears throat> super stable. Again, this is not true when you correct for the data. Because you realize that a lot of the reason the economy might have been unstable in the 19th century was it's an agricultural economy. And so you have harvest failures. Output goes way down in that year. And the next year, the harvest is normal. Output goes way up. And if you just look at it in terms of numbers, you say, well, this economy is all over the map. And then after the Fed, you say, wow, it's much more stable. Well, duh. The economy isn't as agricultural anymore. Hello? So again, this is not a fair comparison. When you correct for all this, you don't, in fact, find the Fed to be uh, an, an improvement. And then, of course, you compare what, what kind of record has it had with the dollar. But looking at, for example, the Panic of 1819. The Panic of 1819 was not caused by some spontaneous market institution. We had People at the time, contemporaries, said what caused this thing was the Bank of the United States, the second Bank of the United States that was created, that was extremely inflationary, got the economy on a sugar high, creating a lot of money, uh, borrowing is very easy, a real estate boom gets going, all the usual things that we typically see in these situations, and then it crashes. And people at the time put two and two together. They said, this, the banking system is rotten, and it's putting our economy in these, in these cycles. And Thomas Jefferson, in the wake of 1819, said, you know what we need? And he urged his friend to introduce um, his legislation for the reduction of the circulating medium. He said, we've got to get rid of all the excess paper over and above the coins to back it and ultimately move to a system where all we're trading in is precious metal coins. And there were other people who were confirmed, John Adams was confirmed in his hard money views by watching the Panic of 1819, and so on and so forth. In 1873, we're told there was a long depression that went for six years. Not so, according to the more recent reconstructions of the debt. In fact, even the New York Times, the one time it was ever right, was when it conceded, and I almost regret that, because I wish it hadn't broken, it's kind of a shame. You know, it's like the, the guy who's got the perfect game up until, you know, the ninth inning, and whatever. Well, um, they say that it turns out that, according to economic historians, there was no long depression of the 1870s. Let me just, just share this one little passage. Um, Recent detailed reconstructions of 19th century data by economic historians show that there was no 1870s depression. Aside from a short recession in 1873, in fact, the decade saw possibly the fastest sustained growth in American history. Employment grew strongly, faster than the rate of immigration. Consumption of food and other goods rose across the board. On a per capita basis, almost all output measures were up spectacularly. By the end of the decade, people were better housed, better clothed, and lived on bigger farms. Department stores were popping up in medium-sized cities. America was transforming into the world's first mass consumer society. Well, finally, very, very quickly on this Fed thing, because I do want to say one more thing before we conclude. Again, I'm sorry for going so long. Anybody who goes this long is like a semi-crank who forgets about people's attention spans, and I apologize for that, but I cannot help myself here. Um, on, this, on this whole matter of bank panics, people say, we had these bank panics, right? Uh, before we had the Fed, we had this panic in 1873, and this panic in the 1890s, blah, blah, blah. and then after the Fed, we didn't have these panics, and isn't that great? Well, okay, well, it turns out there are two factors to consider. Number one is Canada didn't, Canada didn't have any of those panics in the late 19th century, and they didn't have a, a central bank that was alleviating them. They didn't get a central bank until 1934. They had zero panics. And then when in 1929, the great, over the course of the Great Depression, 9,000 U.S. banks failed. You know how many Canadian banks failed? Zero. So what the heck was going on in Canada? The answer was, in the U.S. we had this lovely regulation called unit banking, which said that no bank can have more than one branch. So obviously, in a period of time when transportation is very primitive, that means every bank is lending to like a three-inch area. So anything bad happens in that three-inch area, well, that's, that's it. That's all she wrote. Is that they can't diversify. They're extremely fragile. And so, yeah, well, you wind up getting a lot of problems like that. Canada didn't have that problem at all. So, number one, it's an intervention problem. But number two, we find, uh, I've got a, a paper by a professor at the University of California at Berkeley from just, 2000, just 2009. Contrary to the conventional wisdom, there is no evidence of a decline in the frequency of panics during the first 15 years of the existence of the Federal Reserve. That's a professor at the University of California at Berkeley, big anti-Fed bastion that. But this is becoming a saleable now. These sorts of things have, been, have indeed become saleable. Uh, the panics went away because of the, of the deposit insurance, not because of the Federal Reserve. 
Uh, my last point, I won't talk about stimulus spending. Um, that's just, you know, does anybody think stimulus spending helps? I mean, is that how I'll gladly talk about that in the question period. But I want to leave with this, with the, the situation that young people face. And I am not a pessimist by nature. I am super optimistic, even when I have no right to be. That's just, just the way I am. You know, I, 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 everything in my life I love. I, I enjoy every, every minute of it, except for the kid with the broken glass stuff. And that, I'll admit, that was a bit of a drag. I'm worried about that. But, but, it, but even then, even then, I was able to call up physician friends of mine, some of whom I knew in college, but also like, people I've met at events like this. Who, I have a, a physician friend who said to me, you know, I've read your books and they've benefited me, so if you ever need some medical advice. And so I called them up and said, guess what? <laughs> so that was, that was wonderful. But anyway, but it, it does, this does need to be known. Because here's the great, greatest myth of all, that, that people have misled themselves into thinking that, if, again, if something is desirable, all we need to do is demand it. Resources are unlimited. Taxation can always get us whatever we want because there are always enough rich suckers to be expropriated. Well, it turns out we are living through the disproof of that notion. Because we are about to, it's, it's, okay, so we know that the national debt, you know, $14 trillion, is really high, how are we going to pay? But what are we going to do about Social Security and Medicare? Mostly Medicare, which right now, the present, the present value of the unfunded liability there is $111 trillion. Now that's really, that's going to be a little bit of a pain to try to pay, uh, especially when we consider that the Republicans are going to sweep in, and, you know, like we've all been through this one before. They're going to repeal everything and everything will be fine. We were we've been scammed on this one a million times. I'd love to believe it's true. Now, I would love nothing more than to come back and say, guys, I was so wrong. I was so wrong when I came to see you last time. But uh, they're going to cut $100 billion from the budget. Wow. Wow. That's like $3 off a trip to the moon. <laughs> Great. Oh, my gosh. I think I said that once in some speech. Somebody on Facebook devised an actual coupon with an astronaut. Save three dollars. Act now. Big savings. All right. So we've got this big, this big problem. It's a problem that's gotten to the point where even it's not just like our people. It's not just Peter Schiff. It's not just Jim Rogers. Not the usual names. It's also names we never hear, like like Lawrence Kotlikoff of, of uh, I think Boston University. Now he's a Democrat. He's an establishment guy. And here's what he says. We have 78 million baby boomers who, when fully retired, will collect benefits from Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid that, on average, exceed per capita GDP. The annual cost of these entitlements will total about $4 trillion in today's dollars. So it's an annual. Yes, our economy will be bigger in 20 years, but not big enough to handle this size load year after year. And he goes on to say, this is what happens when you run a massive Ponzi scheme for six decades straight taking ever larger resources from the young and giving them to the old, while promising the young their eventual turn and passing the generational buck. Wow, when, when a Democrat mainstream BU economist says it's a Ponzi scheme, like, this is out in the open now. This is, it's gone mainstream. And this is all going to come to an end, he says, in a very nasty manner. The first possibility is massive benefit cuts visited on the baby boomers in retirement. The second is astronomical tax increases that leave the young with little incentive to work and save. And the third is the government simply printing vast quantities of money to cover its bills. Well, why couldn't it be all three of those? It seems quite possible. And then we're seeing the aging of the population. This is a serious issue. Now, it's not that we regret that we're able to enjoy longer lives. That's not the problem. That's great that we're able to enjoy longer lives. But nobody's made any provision for the health care costs associated with it. And it's, it's many, many, many times more costs associated with uh, the so-called old olds, what uh, demographers call people between 66 and 85. We find that by 2050, the number of people over age 100 in the U.S. will have increased by 13 times. And then we look at all these other figures, whereby uh, the number of people age 80 will outnumber children under age 5. That's never happened in U.S. history. Uh, we have a, a situation in which, uh, in 1940, we had more college-age kids than we had seniors. Uh, by 2040, we're going to have uh, the number of senior citizens multiplying by seven times, 75 million to 20 million college-age kids. How is this going to be taken care of? No one is answering the question. If it comes up, everybody just says, hey, look the other way, and they run away. We, we, get, we get no answer. But we need answers, because who's going to be paying for this? The young people 
who are going to be struggling their whole lives, working and working and working, harder and harder and harder, just to stand still in order to prop up a system that's obviously going to collapse anyway. I mean, this is, this is their fate. There's nothing they can do about this. They're stuck in this. There's nothing we can do. There's no other way we can care for each other other than by loading greater and greater obligations on, on ever more future generations. There's no other way to, to, to do this. There's no way to tax our way out of this. Uh, because the tax rates would have to be raised so high the economy would be destroyed. And plus, ever since 1950, we've seen that no matter what the tax rate is, the tax receipts have rarely exceeded 20% of GDP. This is like some kind of fixed ceiling, political, economic fixed ceiling. And so no matter what you do with taxes, there's just a limit, and you're not going to get more than that. So that is not a way out. You could destroy the currency, and we, could, we would have a civil unrest. It would be unthinkable in a modern economy to see hyperinflation would be absolutely unthinkable. But yet, this, is, this isn't even being talked about. It's all, all what we get on TV is all just trivialities. It's all trivialities, one after the other. And we don't even bother going into what's going on in the states. Oh, good grief. we got like seven states whose um, pension funds are about to go bust by 2020. We've got another 13 states that are going to go bust in 2025. And they're going to go bust in, in those years, assuming that they're making an 8% return every year between now and then. So they're obviously going to go bust far sooner than that. My favorite scheme was New York City. The, the governor supported a plan that would bail out the pension fund by borrowing from the pension fund. <laughs> I mean, th that's it. I mean, we're dead from the neck up. Like we, th there are no solutions being proposed. So what do we do about this? We are on, on the edge of a major default simply because we believe for years and years and years that, some, that every year, basically as Gary Norris says, every year society will just be the same as it was last year, give or take three or four percent. The idea of a default never enters into the picture. The idea that a Detroit that is a living example of regulation and spending and politics no one, no one saw the total collapse of Detroit. And here's a place where the height of the housing boom Median house price, $98,000. Then, a couple years ago, it, it dropped. It dropped to $14,500. You think, oh my gosh, it hit rock bottom. No, it didn't. The next year, it was down to $7,000. 25% of the schools are closing. The money is gone. People are fleeing. Nothing like this has ever been seen in a U.S. city. And, and in comparison with the scale of the collapse, it was unreported, basically unreported. Is that a microcosm of our future? Well. Maybe because of the situation that our wise overlords that we've had superstitious confidence in and superstitious reverence for have put us in. Our, our, our kids and our neighbors and friends have been waving incense in front of these people for decades, thinking there's no problem they can't solve, there's no problem that raising taxes 10% can't solve, and yet here we are staring at face to face. So what do we do? Well, that's a separate issue. That's what my, my book is coming out on February 7th. Called rollback. It is sort of about. At the end, I give some recommendations, um, but you know, you, you give recommendations knowing that all the recommendations that would actually work will be dismissed as unrealistic, even though not adopting them is what's unrealistic. Uh, but for now, what my purpose was just to show that by falling for these myths, by falling into these traps, we—I uh, don't want to say we—they—they they have gotten us into this pickle that is very hard to get out of. Um, and we can get out of it in various ways if we're willing to make great sacrifices in the present. And we're willing to adopt, uh, we're willing to return to a, an era in which we cared for each other. Instead of just pawning off people on, on government bureaucracies, which we looked out for each other. And we treated each other like human beings, humanely. We have to get rid of the smiley face version of government that we were all taught in sixth grade, banish and discard that forever. And we have to likewise take the devil horns off the free market if we're going to have any choice. We need to become knowledgeable, and one tool that I devised to help people with that, people who are busy, they have a million things to do, is I, I, I bought the domain learnaustrianeconomics.com. Easy way to learn all this stuff for free and on your iPod, whatever, so that we can be a formidable force. That, you know, they, you know, they can fool some people, but there'll be fewer and fewer people they can fool. That's very important. But Frederick Bastiat, one of the great heroes of the last couple centuries, the New York Times derisively said, the Tea Party people are reading Frederick Bastiat. Oh, how terrible. But he was a great French economist. And he said that basically, 
what we are, what, what goes on with the state is just mutual legal plunder. Where it would be, it would, I'd be arrested if I went up and stole your money and gave it to somebody else. I'd be arrested for that. But if somebody asked the government to do it, the government got in the ribs, then that's somehow morally different, and that's okay. And he says, you know what the state is? The state is the great fiction by which everyone attempts to live at the expense of everyone else. That's the greatest fiction of all. And it's coming undone. We've all been taught to take. The farmers have been taught to take. The industrialists take. The rich take. The poor take. The middle class take. But where are they taking from? Themselves. What are they doing? With, with quite a big cut taken from the federal government, you know, whose, whose welfare programs eat, are eating up two-thirds of them, 70% eating up in bureaucracy. That's what's coming undone. But it is a libel on the human race to say this is the only way or the best way that we can interact with each other. That we can't improve our condition or that of the least among us without the government gun in the ribs. We've gotten to a point where we're going to have to, not for ideological or philosophical reasons, but for eminently practical ones, we're going to have to put the guns down and treat each other humanely, treat each other like human beings, interacting voluntarily. That is all the free market is, and that would be the first step toward genuine change we can believe in. Thank you. Standing here. All right, everybody. I know we're all, uh, I know we're all uh, greedy capitalists and are just wanting more and more uh, jewels of wisdom from Tom Woods, but unfortunately, we're just getting ready to close here. We're just going to open the floor for a brief set of question and answer, probably 10 minutes max, so keep it relevant, pertinent. And uh, after that, we're going to the wild board uh, for drinks and and ask your trivial questions there. Um, one thing, one thing I do want to include is um, a special thanks to ACSU for the funds to make this whole event possible. Uh, I want to thank Eric Roach and the Young Americans for Liberty, as well as Leslie Hollywood and the Tea Party, and just everyone who's helped get this whole event together. So, with that, I'm going to open the floor to Tom Woods again for some question and answer. Um, so the question, I'm going to repeat the questions. The question involves how, what kind of a free market response, let's, let's assume that global warming is taking place and that it's, it's caused by human activities. Then, you know, what kind of voluntary, you know, free market solution could there be? And, I, you know, I'll be, I'll be honest enough to say that I, I really don't know what the answer to that is, but I do know somebody who does know the answer. It's the second best thing. And that's uh, my friend Robert Murphy. He was the guy who played the zombie in the zombie video. It turns out that he's a PhD economist who's willing to uh, do that to his own dignity just to help a friend. But uh, but I would go to his site and, and, and do searches for that, because I know he's written a paper on specifically this question, and I've always been meaning to do it, and I've always thought, you know, someday somebody's going to ask me this, I'm going to wish I had read this paper. Because uh, I think there are ways, I mean, obviously, you know, you could just say to people, look, this is super urgent, and you just have to start doing it and then maybe people will do it. But, but then people will say, that's just not enough. In this case, we need to have coercion. But, but his, his website is consultingbyrpm.com. Um, and just look at his blog and do a search. I wish I could give a better answer, but maybe what I'll do is, in the next 24 hours or so, I'll also try and uh, go through his site, and I'll post on my own site some links that'll try to answer, because I feel bad not knowing, but you know, I, I don't know everything. But I'll, I'll try and post, that. that's a Tom Woods note. Post that stuff and that link to him, so we'll both be happy. We'll both get some internet hits. Okay. Uh, 
All right, how about an easier question? <laughs> yeah, sure. Uh, all right, I apologize, but one thing I forgot to mention. We are passing around clipboards with, uh, with spaces to sign for people who are interested in bringing Ron Paul to camp. So, yeah, we, yeah, yeah. so make sure you do it. Make sure you get a clipboard and make sure you sign it. They're being passed around right now. So, uh, anyway, right over there. Oh, wait, wait, before we take the next question, let me just say I just want to make sure and clarify that the one kind of question I just can't answer, and I'm not even saying this as a joke, is what should I do with my money? I don't know either. <laughs> um, just, I don't know, just, just try and rely on people you trust at this stage of things. But, but I heard one money manager say, well, there are two positions in an economy like this, a cash position and a fetal position. <laughs> All right, I'm sorry. Yes, please. really interesting to see is Ron Paul heading up this important subcommittee now, which I never thought I would have discussed. Well, I DPR Freedom Watch uh, the other night. And my wife and I just watched that one segment. <laughs> yeah, that is great. So, I mean, I mean, to be perfectly blunt, there's nothing that individuals can do. But let's quote, oh, again, repeat the question. What can we do about the fact that, uh, you know, the Fed is engaged in, the six hundred billion dollar policy and all that, uh, you know. Like, well, the answer is really there's nothing we can do. But the only thing we can do, I suppose, that it's not we can't directly affect it, but we can keep the pressure on in ways that has never been there's never been pressure on the Federal Reserve Chairman to go on television to defend himself, to hire a PR firm, which they did during the audit of the Fed thing. They had, of course, they, they have such a tin ear, they hired the same firm that Enron hired. Yeah, they can't even, can't even do that right. But the fact that that little cartoon video about quantitative easing, I mean, it's, I don't even know, they're like androgynous animals in the sense, like, I don't even know what animals they are. Are they teddy bears? Are they puppies? I don't know what they are. But they're talking about this, and this thing got, like, millions of hits. A, a thing critical of the Federal Reserve making fun of Ben Bernanke. I mean, this is... So, I mean, I would say that, you know, maybe our efforts aren't enough to stop the thing, but that's no reason not to continue with the efforts, because, heck, I'm having a lot of fun in, with this. I, I think it's great that these guys are actually worried that the general public is catching on to, to what they're doing. And then if, it could be that in 2012, we could have in the, uh, among Republican candidates, we could have two people who are anti-Fed. Like, when has that happened in any presidential election ever in history? So it doesn't, you know, it, it, it can't answer all questions, it can't solve everything, but, you know, everything has to start with little steps. And these, we're actually seeing much bigger steps than any of us had the right to expect. The very fact that people can actually say, well, you know, my local and the Fed chapter is doing something. Like, what? Like, what? what, what? And, but, you know, what's also very interesting is that even though Milton Friedman uh, endorsed Ron Paul when, when he was alive, uh, when Friedman was alive, um, and Friedman was not an Austrian, I mean, he believed in the Fed, uh, he wouldn't necessarily support all the things the Fed's doing now, but some of you would have. Uh, but nevertheless, when I travel in these circles, and I give, you know, we have events like this, or I go to a university, or we have these conferences, or Ron Paul gives a big speech, and I talk to people to the extent that they're interested in economics and they're aware, they're all anti-Fed Austrian. I never, I have not one time, I, I, have sh I have shaken so many hands and signed so many books, and I have not one time run into somebody who said, you know, I love Ron Paul, what he's up to, but I'm a Chicago school economist and I disagree with him on the Fed. Not even once. I mean, in academia, they're still very significant, and they still do some good, good work in other areas, but among the general public, they've been completely routed. Among uh, the, the, the freedom people, they're all anti-Fed. That has become the default position. That was not the case before. If you were anti-Fed, even some of the freedom people, even some of the think tanks, treated you as some kind of crank. We just need a nicer Fed. We need one that's on more of a short leash. What's the matter with you? Whereas now, all these institutions are trying to jump on the anti-Fed bandwagon. So, you know, amidst all this, we do have reason to be pleased with our progress. Okay, but we have time for one more. 
I'm sorry I went on for so long. We read never go on for that. Oh, that's that's good. That's nice. Okay. Wait, what? Okay. Yeah, oh, well, I'm not calling other people, so you want to pick that? Yeah, okay. Um, so the question about the 1920-21 Depression, something I've written about, uh, you can find there's a video, and again, I mean, the dorks of the world are my bread and butter, because it's been viewed over 100,000 times. It was a talk I gave here in Colorado, in Colorado Springs in April, on um, the Great Depression of 1920, why you never heard of it. You never heard of it because, in fact, one of the things that I like that Grover Norquist has said was that uh, a depression is a recession the government tried to cure. <laughs> I wish I had thought of that, because, man, that's a good one. But in the 1920 thing, they didn't try to cure it. And so what I've argued, if you, if you go to YouTube, you type in Woods 1920, or in my book Meltdown, I got a discussion of it. You know, you've got double-digit unemployment, you've got um, uh, production way down, you've got wholesale prices falling very dramatically, and all these indications. And we didn't have fiscal stimulus. I mean, we had there were tax cuts. That's a kind of fiscal stimulus. But they didn't kick in until basically the recovery was already underway. We didn't have a stimulus package in the form of increased government spending. They cut the government budget. 50% between 1920 and 1922. The Federal Reserve did not, and you can see this on their own graphs. The St. Louis Fed allowed you to generate graphs of monetary policy. You can generate a graph showing they didn't do anything to reverse this, the money, uh, money supply decline until, again, 1922, after the Depression was over. And so Joseph Schumpeter, who was not an Austrian economist, he was an Austrian economist, but not an Austrian economist, if you follow me. He was a fellow traveler, I suppose. He was a sympathizer in some ways. But one of the great economists of the 20th century, Schumpeter, said that the 1920 Depression alone is evidence in and of itself that the, that the economy does indeed recover. It does, it, does, it, it does adjust itself in the absence of any outside stimulus. So what can we learn from this today? Well, of course, the economy was able to adjust so quickly in that case partly because we had a much more free market economy at that time. There were fewer obstacles in the way. Whereas today, we have some interference in wages, we have uh, uh, a lot more of the unemployment insurance thing, I mean, a lot of things that might get in the way of an immediate adjustment in employment. But still, I mean, it does indicate, I mean, there has to be a reason they never mentioned this episode. You know, they're afraid that we peons might get some ideas. We can't have that. So the very fact that we have evidence that a hands-off policy did not result in a lifelong recession and a continuing downward deflationary spiral into the center of the earth. We didn't have that. Whereas the very first time, as, as Bob Murphy puts it, the very first time the federal government said, hey, we've got to really roll up our sleeves and fix this thing. We've got the longest depression in history. You know, if we don't see a lesson in that, then we just ain't paying attention. All right, I guess that's it for tonight, but we're going to the wild boar. I've never heard of it, but it's a coffee, is it? It's a, uh, it's a coffee shop, but uh, they don't have to bring out the bike because they, I think they have to. I was going to say, you call it the wild boar, and all you have is coffee. I mean, that's a little bit false advertising. But, uh, first of all, but I do just want to say to everybody that I realize that when people hear there's a lecture going on, it's very hard to get people to attend something like this. So I, I want to thank you for taking, you know, I mean, your nights are precious to you. I know that. because. Every night with me, it's like non-negotiable. I've got to be with my kids. And so you took this night to be with me, and it's a, it's a, it's a real honor, and I appreciate it. Thank you very much.